Do bandsaws drift? Is it a myth? Is it a marketing scheme? Or is there really something to it? For as long as I've used bandsaws, I've heard of the mysterious bandsaw drift phenomenon. Yet, I have never really been able to get a definitive answer to the cause of this problem. My first bandsaw was the Grizzly 14-inch saw that I bought about 20 years ago. I spent months trying to get the bandsaw to resaw lumber and gave up a year later after countless hours of swapping blades and customer service phone calls. Just before I started this channel, I bought a second bandsaw at a trade show. There's me and my son with some other guy that photobombed us. This Rikon bandsaw was what I needed to start my YouTube channel. Unfortunately, the same problem started again. The blade would work fine, and then I'd start cutting away from the fence and angled into my stock. But then I remember the fence and the sales pitch that came with the saw. There's a little knob on the side that shifts the fence to account for the blade drift. When it's set, you lock it and now the problem's solved. But it was really only solved for a short time before the problems got worse. It's been a few weeks of donning my internet sleuthing gear, but I have finally got a very definitive answer to this problem. There have been so many different positions and ideas that have sprouted from this phenomenon. Here are just a few. Drift is a blade's natural tendency to pull a workpiece in one direction when cutting. It's caused by a blade that has an uneven set. That is, the set or amount of each tooth is bent away from the blade is not the same on both sides. Last, you will need to account for blade drift, the tendency of a bandsaw blade to pull to one side of the workpiece when cutting. Because of the way a bandsaw blade cuts through the wood, a situation called drift can occur. It's a reaction to the blade shape. Actually, the sharp square angles at the back edge of the blade that makes you angle the wood away from parallel alignment with the blade to make a straight cut. That angle is the angle of drift for your bandsaw blade. Unfortunately, you can't use the same angle of drift for the next blade you install on your tool because every blade has its own cutting signature, which creates a separate angle of drift. With all these bits of information, there's no surprise that the term blade drift has a mystical aura surrounding it. Fortunately for all of us and the industry, there's a couple methods to controlling this problem that has widespread universal support among all the authors that I've researched. The first method involves drawing a line that is parallel to the edge. Back here at the saw, I'm gonna follow the line that I drew earlier. I'm gonna get it about halfway in and then I'm gonna stop the bandsaw. This, according to the experts, is the drift line right there. Now I can place an external fence on the edge like this and I'll put it right on that line. I'm gonna add a couple clamps to the front and the back. Now, as I cut, I should stay on that line. And that really does work very well. For my mechanically advanced bandsaw fence, I still have the ability to use a sliding fence, except after I cut into a piece of stock, I just need to shift the fence to the angle and lock it. Make no mistake, this method works, but it means I'm cutting into a lot of pieces of scrap that I'd much rather save for jigs or other projects. And if you don't have this fence, you're wasting all kinds of scrap wood every time you need to set an external fence. The next method, which really is a very good method, is to create a single point stop that sits next to the blade. A single point bandsaw sled is all in the name. You've got this front edge here. You keep the distance that you're looking to cut away from the blade, and then you lock it down with clamps. Because I really don't like using clamps, I made my own that uses the expansion bar in the slot and I can lock it wherever I want. It's also got a metal tip on it, so it really stops a lot of the friction problems that the wooden ones have. There's two different ways that you can do this. You can set your line on your stock, and then we'll cut in a little ways. Now that the saw is off, I'll go ahead and push this against my stock. Now I just need to cut from here on out. The second method, and the one that I really like using, is to cut both sides of my stock, then bring it over here. I line it up again to the blade. I'll find where I am right in the center. If you didn't watch another second of this video, this would be the best option for your bandsaw. But let me tell you why. While bandsaw blades are a continuous band of teeth, the teeth positions are critical for bandsaws to work. Each tooth is set either to the right of the blade or to the left. With the blade zoomed in, you can see that the teeth alternate on the left, right, left, 
right. I've drawn a line here and exaggerated what the blades look like. When we saw set the blades, it's important because we want to be able to clear the back side of the blade. So the teeth are set at an angle to be able to take the sawdust out and not allow that back of the blade to catch. Some of the reasoning, as I read earlier, is that these teeth are not set correctly. I'll go ahead and erase some of these. If the teeth are not set correctly, the blade is going to travel to the side with the greatest resistance, which would be this way. But this isn't where the majority of the problems occur. If you go back far enough to the 1940s, you'll find that they knew the answer. However, if the honing is overdone, it dulls the blade. If one side of the blade is dull and the other side sharp, the blade leaves off toward the sharp side. It goes on to talk about how the blade invariably becomes dull on the side of the wheel that the blade touches as it spins around. The method to creating blades, as well as the advanced materials that go into those blades, has greatly improved in 70 years. The teeth on modern saw blades stay sharper than at any other time in history. But the problem with one edge becoming more dull over the other has the same consequences as they did 70 years ago. Blade drift occurs due to one side being sharper than the other side. That's why blades that are brand new are more likely to cut parallel to the tabletop edge. But let's test this. I've got my fence exactly 10 inches from the edge. This is a very old blade, so I'm going to check to see which side it drifts to. If I pull this out, you can see that the blade has drifted this way, which would make these teeth sharper than the other side. To test whether or not this doling of one side creates this mystical drift, I'll use a sharpening stone and move it onto the right edge of the blade. Now I'm gonna flip this over to the other side. This is the side I cut last time, and we're gonna see if the blade will shift because of what I've done. And as you can see, it got much wider. That means that I've doled this side enough that it actually pulls the other direction. Just as what was written in the 1949 Popular Mechanics, we can see that having an unbalanced blade in terms of sharpness is the real problem when it comes to drift. Now that we found the reason for drifting, what can we do to stop this? Or can this be stopped? Obviously, the only way to keep a bandsaw blade sharp is to not use it. But to prevent blade drift, we need to make sure that we aren't putting excessive pressure on either side of the blade, prematurely dulling either side. There are a few things that we can do to make blades last. As I've mentioned in bite size number 129, starting on the table saw and hogging out both sides with an inexpensive circular saw blade before bringing the stock to the bandsaw helps. This is how I do nearly all of my resawing. But let's think critically about what's happening with the blade and our stock. In a perfect world, cutting through dead tree carcasses would work the same as a pair of scissors cutting through paper. As a living organism, wood is very complicated. Between species, each slice of a tree reacts differently. In fact, even between trees of the same species, or even the same tree, we can have two pieces of lumber that act very differently. With all of these anomalies, we have to remember that when we work with wood, we're working with an imperfect material. The good news is that when we dry lumber, we are taming it enough that it is far more manageable. We do still need to remember to shop dry our lumber or allow the wood to adjust its moisture and temperature to your shop before use but it's in a form where it can be easily managed. If you're cutting a piece of lumber with the fence, like a table saw, half of your attention will be spent in keeping the stock against that fence. This is putting a lot of stress on the blade, especially if our stock is trying to open up. But you don't have to toss out your bandsaw fence. We just need to make a few adjustments. First and foremost, if you're dividing a small section off a larger section of stock, keep the longer section or the side with the most mass against the fence. If I'm cutting book match pieces, the thicker part is what I'll put against the fence. This will allow our wood to open up. Think about how bandsaws work in lumber mills. The wood isn't sliced from the bottom up, but from the top down. A better method is to add a fence to your fence that stops in the middle of the blade. This will allow your stock to open up as it's being cut, easily allowing the energy to be released. You'll want to use a sacrificial piece of scrap to run it through the blade at the end if you do plan on cutting like this. The second way to do this, as we mentioned earlier, is to use a single point method, which again, allows our stock to open up. As someone that has spent most of their life using bandsaw fences, I'm really impressed with the single point method. If you're interested in the steel nose sled, I have a link 
at the end of this video as well as in the description below. Those methods work for wood that opens, but how about stock that immediately closes as it pushes past the end of the blade? In this situation, adding a wedge into the end helps to also free up our blade. You can buy a pack of these door shims that are perfect when you need them. There are some more basic things you can do to set up your bandsaw for better cuts, which I'll leave a bite size to at the end of this video. But blade drift is due to the blade teeth sharpness and not a strange cutting signature. While the oldest time method of clamping an external fence at an angle can help straighten things, you will still be dealing with a blade that is dull on one side over the other. So that is a very temporary fix. Thank you so much for watching. It means the world to me that you're here. I'd like to welcome a couple new patrons to this channel, both Mike Laurinaitis and Les N. They are part of a growing group of people that help with the equipment and material costs for this channel. Thank you. Michelle B, Keith Current, William L. McNally, Jerry Adams, Tommy QR, Zach Finch, Rich Lightfoot, Tudor the Barbarian, Mike Laurinaitis, Les N, and Gary G. Hit the thumbs up, subscribe, and ring that bell. And I thank you so much for being a part of my shop. Please leave a comment below. Come find me on Instagram at Make Things with Rob. And remember to keep making things.